Hi, this is Ben Emlyn Jones, regular guest on the Paranormal Peep Show. Tune in to Neil and Andy for all your paranormal updates and insights, and quirky fun chat with some seriously spooky topics. Hi, welcome back to part two, where we're talking to Hugh and Jim regarding their book, The Stonehenge Giants and uh, Ancient Britain. So where we left it, we were talking about cannibals and um, their kind of dietary requirements of giants. I mean, (laughs) uh, we're obviously joking here, but I mean, the sort of things that these giants kept and going. I mean, as I said in the break, you can't just pop down to the local supermarket to feed giants. And then presumably they're going to eat a lot more than the average person. So. Do you think it was like the local villagers or whoever might have kind of uh, tried to keep the giants at bay by feeding them or keeping them happy by giving the odd sacrifice to them, maybe? One of the mythologies, um, I I think of Peru, uh, uh, is that um, the giants were marauding. They were eating all the food. They were, you know, they they were causing so much disruption that, you know, you have to wonder, you know, if these marauding giants existed, what they ate. And I will say that the, the Fomorians in Ireland, they were, they were supposed to be supposedly sea raiders who showed up, but they were giant sized. The Baylor with the one eye, the Cyclops eye was their leader, malevolent zoological nightmare. And they demanded at Samhain uh, child sacrifices, just like in Halloween, right? That's where that tradition came from. Cause we have all these unicorn and rainbow traditions these days, but they hearken back to a time that had to do with with ideas that were much more malevolent. Oftentimes, I, I, I will give Edgar Casey's take the the mystic on um, sacrifice. He said originally the temples uh, were made and they sacrificed sacrificed fruits and flowers and they sacrificed the selfish desires of the self. So they were tools of enlightenment to get, you know, rid of anger and malice and and, and all the negative emotions. But then they devolved uh, into human sacrifice, as we know from the Mesoamerican cultures like the Aztecs and the Mayans and um, similar things. The Phoenicians, the Carthaginians, uh, they were they demanded human sacrifice. There was all this weird child sacrifice. And you wonder if it is uh, tied to this um, mythology. I will say that the Fomorians are noted, I think it's in the Yellow Book of Lekin, a med- medieval script um, from ancient Ireland, that they had three sets of teeth, which is wow. interesting. Because Hugh and I found accounts all over the United States of double rows of teeth. Gilgamesh, Hercules, they were noted to have multiple rows of teeth. You go to the Canary Islands, Buenaventura, in the 1500s, there's a Spanish account of a 14-foot uh, tall giant unearthed with 80 teeth. So you have this tradition of extra teeth, just like extra digits associated with giants. And the Fomorians had three rows of teeth and they were engaged in, um, you know, in human sacrifice and child sacrifice as well. Wow. Which is awesome. And and I mean, (laughs) must have been really expensive dentists and things to look after those teeth. (laughs) Now, wasn't there a case that there's, there's been found a tooth of a giant? Uh, I saw a reference to in your book where someone's got a giant's tooth somewhere in a case or something. We have we have a few accounts of that actually. I mean, there's uh, several are reported in Britain. I mean, uh, there's some in Sardinia which we think are actually cow teeth. In our previous book, though, we did uh, have have a, an example of a tooth on the show, on the TV show, which ended up not being human, but it was actually an animal. Uh, a cow or bullock or something like that but yeah we, i mean we've got lots and lots of stories about teeth because often as jim mentioned earlier these skeletons might crumble to dust when they're disturbed when they're pulled out and oxygen attaches to them they tend to crumble to dust or shatter and things like this but the teeth often survive and we've got numerous descriptions we've got some in somerset which were linked with this can geek giants who were supposed to have built stonehenge uh where giant teeth you know almost you can almost just about fit them in your hand were found um and also we've got some accounts mainly we've got these in north america which jim mentioned the, the double rows of teeth but we get a few accounts with supernumerous or extra teeth or extra numbers of teeth actually in the mouth in Britain as well. Uh, we've, there's even one of the 
mounds near Stonehenge, they found a skull with extra teeth. They found it down in Dorset. They found it on the Outer Hebrides. They found various places. And these are often linked with this genetic state of giants and the, and the kind of lineages that, that pass down these kind of things. You also get like the, the, the ro robust jaw bones, the extra teeth. I mean, even in America, we had some horned skulls, which is Jim's favorite subject. And we got, you know, even like tails coming off the back of them and, you know, dwarf skeletons, you know, pygmy skeletons being found with giant skeletons and things like this. So it gets really weird the more you look into it. I'll tell you that. Mm. Well, I mean, we've got, we're, we're supposed to have uh, uh, tail bones that have kind of shrunk, haven't That's we? That's right, yeah. So mm -hmm. that kind of like makes, uh, there's a specific name for it, but I forget, forget what it is. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, there's, there's quite a few uh, traits though, aren't there, Jim? I mean, you get the, uh, you know, yeah. you get the kind of very broad, wide kind of face, like he like skulls. You get a naturally like the Neolithic people and more elongated, thinner, kind of more, you know, le less profound skulls. So yeah, you get quite a few differences but yeah the, the teeth thing i mean i mean having a having a, two rows of teeth in each jaw would be really handy if you're a cannibal so. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you wonder why indigenous people and in disconnected cultures did some of the extreme things that they did you know you go around africa there's scarification there's like lip rings and elongated airs elongated skulls <clears throat> found all around the world i mean it's amazing and and all these cultures that didn't have any connection now, there is like Brian Forrest is a friend of ours and he's like uh, an elongated skull guy. And there's an argument that some of these skulls aren't human. And I don't know what to make of that. Uh, but what I will say is it's such a, such a strange and bizarre thing to cradle board your infant and elongate the skull. Mm. And all these Native American tribes did it here. And then over to Crimea and in Peru, and you have these bizarre looking skulls. It's like, I, I did, I just think it's shocking that 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 similar. Would you ever like imagine we lived in a culture, a Neolithic culture, and you know we hunt to gather, we did all these things. Would any of us ever come up with the idea to do that to <laughs> to our kids? It's so bizarre. It's, it's so, so bizarre. bizarre. But yeah. it's everywhere around the world, and it it's considered uh, a a member of the royal class or a status thing, like Akhenaten, right? Mm. So then you you go to the Adena people in the United States, and they are the first mom builders who were exceptionally tall, males well over seven foot tall, females over six foot tall. The general population was usually cremated. And in these burial mounds, you find these Adena massive, you know, massive jaws, massive bone structure, elongated skulls. So just to, to push that away, like I know the skeptics argument is they, they argue these are not alien, these are human. And I'm like, that's not really the point. Why are all these cultures doing that? That that is to me is fascinating. And who are we emulating? Right. Mm. That mm. that's the point. Because you got these religious leaders like the popes with the the big hats as well. There's mm. a connection with that as well, isn't there? I think there's all kinds of iconography that you find. It, it's there's only I'm a Jungian, so there's only one collective unconscious, right? So these archetypes keep pop, popping up. You know, it's the Starbucks. You have the fish goddess. Like, mm. why are these things? Um, um, recycling in, in the human psyche and finding their way into movies and finding their way into symbology because there's a story there. And it's usually um, when you go back in time, like Jack the Giant Killer, that there's a story rooted in some mytholog mythological traditions that have a reality. And, you know, uh, I, I just think look at the world that way and look at all the symbolism that's going around and look at the specific and bizarre nature of the things that human civilizations have done and uh you know opens the door to uh, a more bizarre past I'll, I'll say that it's interesting how things are, are kind of uh, changing and morphing because like let's say that the giants were the norm or they were quite prolific so you've got the giants but then as you go into the medieval period um, um a lot of buildings within the uk certainly are quite have quite short doors or quite short roofs because people are hell of a lot shorter. So kind of like the human kind of size went down, but now we're kind of like beginning to go, well, we become taller for whatever reason. It's strange. So it's like giants are then short and then maybe we're evolving into giants again. <laughs> were there different atmospheric conditions in the late Pleistocene and far back? That's a, that's a question. Why do we have megafauna and mega flora, but maybe mm. not make humans? There were giant beavers out where I live, uh, all kinds of, you know, giant sloths, giant ferns. And then there seemed to be, a, well, there was a cataclysm 
and like Velikovsky um, hypothesized, was you know like a almost a planetary cataclysm that caused different at atmospheric conditions to develop? That's a good question, uh, and that's a fair hypothesis because uh, right away you know the skeptical say, oh no, you can't have a fifteen foot human because of gravity and all this. I'm like. Well, what do you make of the dinosaurs? Yeah, I was about to say the dinosaurs. <laughs> Actually, interestingly, someone, I think it was a couple of years ago, they talked about, the they, they theorized that the gravity of the Earth was different in the time of the dinosaurs because they talked about the brontosaurus with a great big long neck and the tail. It wouldn't be able to hold us all that in the current kind of gravity. Um, so whether that was something to do with the pull of the moon or whatever, the size of the Earth or the spin of the Earth, I don't know. But uh, this was uh, the, the thought given around the time of the dinosaurs. Yeah, I'll, I'll give um, one thing I like to say every talk we have, every interview we do is like you and I have honed our skills by bouncing f f uh, back and forth with academics and, and making our case and delving deep because there's no peer review in the alternative world. And there are, there's like, there's a lot of snake oilers and there's a, there's a lot of bullshit artists and scammers and people who want to make a gig out of it. And I find, you know, like Hugh and I, Freddie Silva, Greg Little, Andrew Collins, there's a lot of people who are enthralled with the story and just want to get to the bottom of the truth. So when you're, you know, if you just make one side of the argument, it can be very compelling, but we like to go to the other side and see what the skeptical side is and, and hear both sides of the argument and not get lost in an echo chamber of true believers. And I think that's the best way to solve these problems and to um, you know, articulate and make your point. If you have a good case, you should be able to defend it. And so when people hear, you know, watch somebody's shitty YouTube video, don't be enthralled with it. Look, go to the other side of the argument and see if it holds water. So I, I like to say that because I, I, I think that um, um, there's, there's a lot of dynamics, like everybody's preferences are weaponized by algorithms you know, political or otherwise. And you can end up in a place where you're in, you're in an echo chamber and you're not hearing both sides of the story. So I think that's important. Mm. I think that's true for the paranormal world as well. I mean, um, even though I come from kind of like a clairvoyant direction, I will always try and look at the rational, first of all, for instance, when taking part in ghost hunts and ghost investigations and things like that, you've got to look at what's the rational before you start jumping to the paranormal. Yep. Mm. Mm. Now, we alluded to very briefly in part one, the female giantesses, uh, which just in your mind's eye, you kind of just think of giants like BFG, great big grizzly men eating children and things like that. <laughs> so uh, presumably, if these race of giants have to continue, uh, are they pairing off with these female giants? And, and, and is there being bones found of female giants? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, there's there's uh, been a lot of accounts of that. I mean, it's it's. I mean, I think when a lot of these skeletons were being uncovered, they, uh, you know, it was long, quite a long time ago. Or some of them were found up to a thousand years ago, for instance, uh, like the one in Glastonbury. And uh, yeah, and certainly some of them were female. That's for sure. But if we if we go back into the stories of the giants, the giantess mythos is kind of older really than the male giant stories you know if you go back and back and back one of these stories that we come across a lot first of all you know we have you know we'll start off at the very beginning where we have the story of albina who i mentioned briefly earlier and she and this she is one of the creation stories of britain along with brutus the trojan and gog magog and so forth but this is as relevant as well and this is actually said to be before that time where she was banished from greece uh, her and a third uh, 33 sisters including Albina that's where the name Albion may have come from mm -hmm. um, they arrived here uh, after they killed all their husbands because they didn't want to be kind of you know committed and things like this they arrived here there was nothing here apart from these strange demonic figures who uh, were brought in because and they agreed to kind of have sex with them if you like because they were so bored and frustrated <laughs> and things like that this is but this is how the story goes like, after a minute. and then they eventually gave birth to these giants and this so you got semi-divine incubi demonic you know breeding with female women and these giants get born and like and then it got to a point where they were the only people in the land so they started they were breeding then they were then breeding with their giant offspring and they were breeding with each other and this whole incestuous craziness and this whole race of giants emerged from this and it's said that they spread out through the land they got a, a unruly cannibalistic much like the whole Nephilim story in the Bible is very similar. And then eventually 
uh, the remaining giants, the ones because they were like battling between themselves and other myths and stories talk about this. And there's even reports from the 1400s where they were finding skeletons which backed up this Albina story. And then um, the remaining ones ended up in Cornwall. And these were Gog Magog and his 20, I think, 24 kind of warrior uh, giants who were with him, who eventually when Brutus and the Brutus, the Trojan came over with the Corinius, his warrior kind of leader, that's who they battled with. And so then that story emerged from there, which then spread into London and you get the protectors of London, Gog and Magog at the, um, the Guild Hall and so forth. But so that's one of the kind of female, because, you know, even in the, the early stories, Albina was very, very tall. She was a, a slight giantess herself, not ridiculously tall, but they were robust, powerful, tall females. So then you've got another element of the whole giantess mythos, really. And this this is to do with um, the giantess and the apron full story. Now, it sounds kind of crazy. It sounds like a giantess with an apron is to do with cooking and things like this. But actually... If you look into it carefully, this is what J.J. Ainsworth has done, who's my partner who's asleep upstairs at the moment. This whole story about wearing the apron, what they would do is they would stride, they would have a starting point, very specific in the stories, and an end point, another ancient site or area they were going to. They had to carry these stones in their apron from one point to another. And halfway through their journey, either the apron strings will break, or they trip over, or they'd be tricked by someone, and these stones would fall down and create this megalithic site, which became known as a stone circle, or a burial chamber, or a dolmen, or a series of standing stones. And these stories are everywhere. I mean, they're strong. I mean, even like um, there's a famous um, burial chamber in Anglesey called Barclodiad de Gowers. And that means giantess of the apron full. And you have various other sites like this as well. You have the same thing at Loughcrew in Ireland, where you have the story of the witch or the hag or the or the Kaliak. I'm not sure how you say it. And um and that actually, if you trace it back, it goes back to a giantess story of her striding across the landscape and dropping stones from an apron. So we even have that a famous site up in the Boyne Valley of Ireland. And so all these stories, and, and we, we, me and JJ were wondering, well, what the hell does this mean? What is this apron full thing? So JJ simply translated it from old Latin, and apron means map basically translates as mapper. So they're realizing they were talking about these giant houses where the surveyors, they were laying out the sites, specifically placing sites. They were measuring the land. They were geomancing the land, shaping the landscape to make it harmonious. And these are the oldest stories. And some of these go back to the early Neolithic, possibly the Mesolithic, even the Paleolithic, when you start looking into these goddess kind of statues that were found in places like Grimes Graves in East Anglia and yeah. other areas across Europe. And um, and so, yeah, so we realized there's something in that. And we kind of conclude, and we write about this in the book, um, that we think actually they were the original surveyors. They were they were like the almost the directors of the sites. The females were they were revered. They had this intuition about where to place sites, which is it's not all just about measuring and surveying the very kind of male focused way of doing things. It's intuitively knowing where to place things, and so there's that side of it. We we find absolutely fascinating and that we have this tradition that, that seems to be older than the giant traditions that then kind of got taken over as the patriarchal society kind of became prevalent so yeah i mean we've got multiple accounts of this even in malta we get this as well malta and gozo we have the giantess sansuna who was said to have created gigantia the largest oldest site there by carrying stones uh, in her apron and on her shoulders and dropping them in a dead straight line again over specific, specific points. Even the Sansuna Dolmen actually found a ley line that connects with another site going across three islands in that part of the world. And so, yeah, you have to question, you know, what, what these stories really encode. What's the story behind the giant causeway in Ireland? Jim. Um, it's a geological phenomena, <clears throat> but the, uh, mythology is that there was um, Benard, what, the, what the hell is his name? There, were, there was uh, Finn McCool on the Irish side and Benno Denner, I think, on, on the Scottish side. And they basically had an ancient battle. And Finn made the causeway to get over there. And um, 
so, so there's this this mythology about the, the site is a natural um, phenomena with basalt hexagonal mm. blocks <clears throat> yeah. and like the Staffa cave is it's incredible geology. But the, there is a giant mythology uh, woven into the landscape there once again. And like you said, it might have to do with the, this ancient geomancy. Like it was very important for the ancients to understand, you know, whether it's at Machu Picchu or Stonehenge or Avebury or whatever, the the the, the toleric hotspots, the way like you go to the acupuncturist and you get needles in your body that are attuned to get the energy flowing correctly. The same thing with megalithic sites and megalithic stones. And there was a science, like a mystical blend of science and spirituality that was practiced in the past. Now we have kind of a left brain male dominated, you know, paved the world mentality that has lost that intuitive right brained side. Um, so you have that going on in the ancient world. I do want to jump in for a sec that if you sure. listen to the traditions, this isn't like oh, a 10 foot guy had sex with a normal sized woman. This is like these genetic engineers created, you know, like the incubi mate with, with demons or they're the demons. This is all this wild supernatural stuff that is occurring. And Albina and Al Albion are brother and sister, husband and wife. William Blake specifically notes that Albion was androgynous. Isis and Osiris in Egypt, brother and sister, husband and wife, androgynous. Same thing with Fuxi and Nuwa in, in China. You go over to Samaria, Enlil and Ninlil, brother and sister, husband and wife. Viracocha, Mamacocha in Peru, once again, the same thing. They're all self-fertilizing androgens. You go to the temple of Edfu and the building texts are written on the walls. And they say that the Enead, the original eight gods, Isis, Osiris, Geb, Shu, they're all androgynous, self-fertilizing beings. The same thing the Sumerians say. So these are the architects, the engineers. They they like in soul or they they procreate in a different way than modern day humans. So an anthropologist is gonna say, where are the giants? Are they the Denisovans, Heidelbergensis? You know, show me the lineage. And I don't know if the story is there. It almost seems like a supernatural genetic creation story, you know, along with hybrids and, and other things. So that that's what the tradition states. And I think like, is it not um, uh, curious that the gods all around the world are self-fertilizing androgens who are brother and sister and husband and wife, mm -hmm. even like isolated Pacific islands, you know? So that to me is like, there is a message there. There is a, a mythology that has reality there. And the rationalistic, the abusively rationalistic, left brain, male dominated mind of the 20th century can't envision that because it's like we don't see that happening today, right? Oh, so but do we? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, so okay. So past, this this is this is interesting. Yes, um, these guys just, just had vivid imaginations, you know. Yeah, the um, Rudolf Steiner, Blavatsky, Casey, Plato, Aristophanes displays the myth of the ancient androgen, the Swedenborgians. Uh, basically, every god is androgynous. Humans were first androgynous. Even Plato says that. Mm. Uh, the Nomo, the Dogon people say that the first creation of humans was androgynous. Then we devolved into split. Then Zeus, there's amphoras with androgynous beings. There's androgynous and I, I, uh, iconography around the world. Humans get split into male and female. And it's like, eh, where's my soulmate? I'm a freaking black hole. You know, it's, it's like a devolution into matter. And that's what occurred. And the metaphysical take is that we are re-emerging to a more uh, less needy, less um, desperate species that's evolving into more of an androgynous nature. All the gods are androgynous. Even the spiritual masters are displayed as androgynous. And whatever people overvalue or over um, relate to in modern society, whether you know, uh, you know, the left and the right take it in higher directions and they see things that aren't there. I just believe that there are more beings coming back to the earth and we are moving back into a more androgynous nature. That's what the mystics mm. say. Anyways. And like everything else I've mentioned, every culture around the world, like the Zuni culture sent we to Washington DC in the late 1890s. He was a shaman, a man dressed as a woman. They, all the newspapers, he meets Teddy Roosevelt. Indian princess shows up at the White House, and he's a man dressed as a woman. He's a powerful burdock, two-spirit people. 
the natives had this have this reverence for gay, lesbian, and transgender people, thinking they're embodying the the two polarities mm. better than the split dichotomy that that the rest of us embody. And so there are these traditions that you know you are more connected to the metaphysical world when you are less sexually ambiguous. Mm. Uh, and yeah, I'll just say that I feel like these souls are showing up on Earth, and um, and uh, you know. I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I think that's what it's, may be occurring. Yeah, I was going to ask about the the connection between Hearn the Hunter, the Green Man, all those pagan things. Now, the Green Man and Hearn the Hunter is, always seems to be portrayed in in books and films and things or TV shows like Robin Hood and that as a real big guy. Is, is there like a connection between these ancient giants and those pagan kind of ideas of the Green Man, or is it just me thinking that way? Yeah, it does appear to be you thinking that way. No, no, just just kidding. There, there, there is uh, there, there is a, there is a couple. Well, you got the classic thing, haven't you, with the Robin Hood story? You got little John. I mean, that, that's yeah. one. That's one of the things that, and they, you know, as you probably know, probably your listeners know that there's a kind of tradition going way, way back, linking him with the Green Man mythos. You know, with the whole mm. kind of Robin Hood and the Green Man mythos. Um, and so, yeah, so it could well be. I mean, you, you and you go back. You're also going back to like the whole. Um, St. George story kind of starts linking in with that as well, having emerged from that kind of thing. And but I'm fascinated because you, you've actually got like accounts uh, where there's even one which is said to be the burial of Little John in Nottingham, not in Nottinghamshire. It's in the book actually. It's supposed to be the grave of Little John, and he was actually buried there. And, and there was also his uh, what was it a quarter staff or some kind of weapon that he had, uh, like a huge bow and bow and arrow type thing that was on display up there as well. But whether whether the Green Man mythos, I mean, I think we we haven't really gone into that side of it. But we've seen this change happening over time as further you go back, having less pagan motifs and blending into Arthurian stories, then blending into more Christian stories, because the Arthurian thing really was big. I mean, that took over before the Arthurian thing. So we're talking about the fifth century AD, probably maybe sixth century. That's when the Arthurian story kind of started emerging really strongly for some reason. It might have been a bit after that. And then it was popularized with Geoffrey of Monmouth and various other writers soon after that. But, to, but before that, everything was related to giants. It was like the giant stories, the giantess stories, um, you know, cannibals and things like that. And then the giants became known, the giants who were heroes became known as King Arthur. Arthur was the hero. And so after the giants who were the heroes became King Arthur and all the stories got changed over. That's why you have dolmens called St. Arthur's Coit and things like that, because actually they've changed it. And then it became like the devil became the giant. You know, when you're talking mm -hmm. about like the devil, there's even stories of the devil carrying stones in his apron and like being tricked at certain points. So you can see there's like a timeline, you know, of changes going on there. But whether there's a direct connection with the Green Man, I'm really not sure. Mm, mm, it's interesting. And, and also the, the idea of, um, where was I going with this? Yeah, I know. Uh, we were talking about it before. Uh, there's a lady called Deborah Hatswell who talks about British Bigfoot, you alluded to it in part one, uh, Sasquatches and things like that. Now, obviously, the US is pretty big, big place, lots of places where Sasquatches can hide out and things like that. Now, Deborah maintains the idea that there are British Bigfoot here. Um, could that, again, be connected to these idea of giants that maybe if there is Bigfoot kicking around, maybe people have misidentified it and thought, well, you know, I think it's a Bigfoot, say, says someone, but in fact, it's actually a, a giant, a human giant, if you like, or do you think we we got a bit of mix and match of both going on there? You want me to go? <laughs> Sorry, I was muted now. I was just unmuting myself. I apologise. But now I've actually got it up in front of me here because I, you know, I, I was hoping you were going to ask about this. Um, because there's in Welsh tradition that is a Bigfoot story. Uh, people who've witnessed it. Um, it was collected, I think, in the uh, late 1700s, early 1800s. There's a place called the Hairy Man's Cave. That's what it, you know, in North Wales. And they talk about shepherds actually witnessing this giant man who was 
completely covered in hair, but he looked like a human, but he was completely covered in hair, wandering about. And then you have all these stories of ogres in the area. There's a place called, I think, the Ogres Pass or something like this. Um, and also you have like various stories that then got picked up at that time that talked about this. And so, and also you got the big grey man and you got uh, Ben McDewey up in Scotland as well, where that's got supernatural connotations where they often hear kind of um, footprints and then they witness this kind of shadowy grey being, which looks like a big hairy creature. Um, but people have actually like kind of, you know, there's a, like you say, this person who's uh, been doing this research, I'll be following this other guy who's doing research on British Bigfoot as well. And there's like more and more, not just sightings, but more of these secret traditions uh, that were often thought to be like giant traditions might actually be referring to this, um, you know, where you, you sort of, things are sort of talked about at a great distance and so forth. But like, but like, but often with like, you know, even on Caddy Idris as well, where you get the giant Idris um, up in North Wales in, in Gwynedd, you have not, he's like, the, he's like a holy astronomer of Britain. He's like a master geomancer laying out the land and ruling in the fifth century AD and so forth. But there's a, a beast who was called Monarch of the Mists or the Grey King, who was associated with Snowdonia and particularly Caddy Idris. So there's like a mix of these different things going on where you get these different stories but i mean i'm pretty much you know because britain's so small but there's a huge amount of woodland here still who knows <laughs> maybe they're still around hmm. have you guys heard of the hairy hands no but that sounds freaky yeah <laughs> so this is this is again this is mythology but it's um it's supposedly kind of supernatural ghostly but could it be ghostly um, with the Sasquatch vibe, I don't know. But the Hairy Hands is basically um, a legend in Dartmoor in uh, the English county of Devon, where drivers uh, reportedly kind of like are driving along a certain stretch and there's these p a pair of hairy hands that appear and kind of oh. like take over uh, the wheel of the car or something i or? think that's along the lines of it yes they yes exactly that i'm, it's I'm on dead Wiki driving instructor I think. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, on, I'm on wikipedia looking at it at the moment but um, what sparked it off is talking about the hairy side of things in the hairy man's cave and i'm, I'm pretty sure on strange but true the uh, show with michael aspel in the 1990s which i was addicted to and absolutely <laughs> loved it anyone listening to this show right now just go onto youtube strange but true michael aspel it's absolutely fantastic fantastic series after you watched our show after you watched our <laughs> show but yeah and i'm pretty sure the hairy hands was on that and just uh, talking about the hairy hairy man's cave yeah this the, these ghostly hairy hands try and take over the wheel and kind of steer you off into the bogs well to be lost forever it's kind uh, of fairy realm stuff isn't it it's kind of, sort of <laughs> hitting into the fairy realm you know that's the kind yeah. of thing yeah. where you get like trickster kind of um energies kind of like messy yeah. And yeah. things like that yeah yeah I'll, I'll, yeah i'll throw out there that Edgar Casey specifically stated that in Atlantis, the negatively oriented uh, sons and daughters of darkness <laughs> were genetic engineers who created beasts of burden mm -hmm. to till the lands, to to carry out tasks. They were called the things, and it, it's a it sounds like the, the, this Bigfoot like creature that that high had a it was a mixture of a a beast of burden with a high intellect, mm -hmm. and. The um, like um, Rudolf Steiner, Blavatsky, the Freemasons, the Rosicrucians, they all claim that Atlantis uh, was a reality destroyed mm. flood. And then you have, um, like K uh, Casey said, that the giants were part of the population in the, the genetic mix as well. And these lost lands are talked about in the British Isles and elsewhere, like the Tuatha de Danin. They come from four island continents. And then you have High Brazil and Lyonese. And we know that Doggerland in the English Channel, is that correct, uh, was this, this huge landmass that was submerged like 8,000 BC. So you have this idea of this these creatures, possibly this Bigfoot, being a byproduct of, of um, this lost land and genetic in, uh, intervention or creation. And uh, it, it's funny because Casey, most of his stuff was just like run-of-the-mill uh, me medical medium stuff. But then he started, and he had a lot of a huge following. He's the father of holistic medicine. But then he started to talk about Atlantis and hybrids, and he was a conservative Christian, so he was really freaked out because he would tap into the source who talked about reincarnation as a reality, and eventually he had just came around to agree with it. Uh, so 
the the conservative Christians think he's evil because he believes in reincarnation and things like that. So there's this 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 rifts, but um, I just find it really interesting these ideas of 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 these beasts of burden being created that everybody you know seeing this Bigfoot like creature. And you and I were talking uh, b- before at the break about the idea of the lost lands is definitely tied to advanced civilizations and giants. That's for sure. Mm. And so what is the Lost Lands, like Atlantis and these other places? Yes. Lemuria and things like that. Uh, Lemuria in the Pacific. Atlantis, Casey says there were three destructions, 50,000 B.C., 28,000 B.C., and then the final one about uh, 10,000 B.C., the Younger Dryas Impact event. And that was the final destruction that Plato talked about as well, the complete disappearance of of the landmass in the middle of the Atlantic you know, from the Canary Islands over the Caribbean, like a huge man uh, landmass, and that's where the gods came from. That the survivors, the zoological nightmare of the Fomorians came from this lost land once again. When you talk about these bizarre creatures and hybrids that we're talking about, so uh, interestingly, in Kent in 2015, they found a bizarre hybrid uh, animal burial where they took a bunch of animal pieces and made. Uh, a, a composite hybrid burial, and the archaeologist said that ancient Britons had the same hybrid beliefs that the Sumerians and the Egyptians have. You could Google that and find the article. It's in Kent, I believe. Um, human uh, bizarre burial, but the ancient people of all these cultures definitely believed that these hybrid creatures were were real, which is interesting. And, and what are we doing now? Um, we're, we're, um, again, a new source. Let's see if I can find it. Somebody has tried to hybridize a pig and a human. I came across that recently. Nice. I don't know who comes better off, the pig or the human. Yeah, right. It's, it's, it's really dangerous territory. Here we are. Uh, National Geographic. So uh, reputable source. Nationalgeographic.co.uk. Human pig hybrid created in the lab. I think this is dangerous. I don't know what you think. It's Dr. Think Moreau, isn't it? Really? Yes. That's pretty, because because <laughs> The, the morality of it, humans have certain rights, pigs get slaughtered, slaughtered for bacon, human white hybrid, where does that lie well, you know, in g- terms of legality? I'll, I'll give Edgar Casey's take that a mm. lot of these Atlantean ideas are coming to the fore once again. Strange interactions with genetics. Um, yeah, it's good to be Larry because <laughs> science, I'll, I'll quickly say in 2015, they showed a robot built by Boston Dynamics and it's going like this, and it's falling back in the font, and everybody's laughing. And now they showed the dancing robot. I don't know if you saw the video. And all these fucking people are saying, oh, isn't that cool? And I'm like, that's Terminator 3. Are you out of your mind? Yeah. Can you imagine yeah. the security <laughs> force of those fucking things coming yeah. in? It's like, have you, have you, seen, so- the, have you <laughs> seen the robot dogs with the machine guns mounted? And it's, 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 like, it's insane. <laughs> I tell you what, this, this is all starting to sound like ancient, the stories of ancient Ireland, both of what you're saying there, because you got like the Firbolgs and the Fomorians had these grotesque combinations of different creatures. You know, this is like talked about. And uh, the Tour de Danan and the, I think the Fomorians as well, had this high level descriptions of technology and weaponry, talking about kind of advanced laser technology and, and like speed and like boats that could go across the water and things that could fly, things that could like, you know, make you travel through space and time and things like this. And this is all talked about in these mm-hmm. old stories, as well as these strange hybrid creatures. And we're talking like in Britain here or, mm-hmm. or Ireland. And so, you know, what, what you know, what's happening? now may have been happening back then because they seem you know they to me they were an advanced culture back in these ancient times it's just a different way of doing things that, mm. that's a good point like the descendants from this law lo- these lost lands like nuada of the silver hand he had an amputated mechanical hand you know mm. he had you know uh mac mayor mac Manon, what is it mac Manon, mac Lair, isle of man is named after he's the sea god and he has a silver chariot and he has an invisibility uh, helmet. And you got to, like, why is Lord of the Rings so enthralling? Why do the archetypes like this grab people's attention? You know, because there is truth. That's a Tolkien was drawn into this world because we're recreating this freak show acid trip world of the past. And we do have to be careful. But these themes are coming through once again. And I think it's being done on a less humanistic way these days where it's like coal technology Everybody's out to launch. They're checking their Bitcoin price, so they're, they're, they're you know buying an NFT or some, some 
you know, crazy thing. There's like a disconnect from reality. Like our hands are not in the earth anymore. And I'm not going to get in the soapbox. I'm just saying that, yeah, be wary of technology <laughs> for damn sure. And I'll just say, like, somebody's tweeting the other day about why they're depressed. And he's like, is it because I stare into a flash- flashlight that gives me bad news all day? You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> the freaking iPhone. It takes your brain, your mind to the lowest level of the Denver airport where there's like aliens and generals, you know, it's like, what the hell is this? It's like the shittiest technology, you know. <laughs> so, Sorry, with, but, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, we talked about the Smithsonian and the, them hiding all these bones in the US and, and secreting them away and things. Uh, is there any evidence for the bones in the UK being pushed around to any uh, secret places? Yes, there are. Yeah, there's there's a few. There's uh, I went to the Isle of Man and uh, I did a bit of. I was, there's known skeletons and bones around Earth. There we've got a whole section in the book. Um, that's a fascinating place in it, in its own right with the megaliths and everything else. But we knew there was an account. We knew it had been ended up in this museum, and I looked through the records at the museum and it was it was known about. It was recorded. It was reported. I think it was a seven or seven point seven and a half foot skeleton maybe eight foot and then it said oh and and, and then this report that we read oh well it's vanished it's, it's di- mysteriously disappeared from the collection and that was the end of it do you know what i mean okay. and we, i was like really i was like you know we could have could have had some evidence here um you know right in our hands but again it's, it's the same thing it's like not only, i don't think it's just they're just covering it up i think there's a whole other thing um relating to the fact that people want to have these relics. They're very important. They're very sacred relics. If the traditions are known about, we're talking about these kind of elite sort of um, Masonic kind of groups. They kind of want to have access to these things for their own kind of purposes. So I I think a lot of them get disappeared like that and they're in private collections um, because they don't want this kind of different history emerging. And I think I think it's much more prevalent because of the Smithsonian Institution in America. But the problem also in America is that you have NAGPRA, you have the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, where that came in in 1990. So over there, it's technically illegal to have anything on display or have anything in your possession. You can go to prison for years for it, you know, get huge fines and things like that. And there are similar kind of ethical rules here as well to do with graves goods and bones and things like that uh which which gets more tighter the more time goes on but there's also one other thing just relating to that is like the kind of change in not just the disappearance of um bones and artifacts but also the disappearance and the kind of ridiculing and removing of these stories and traditions from school curriculums because back in the 1920 up until the 1920s these were being taught at school the traditional version of how england was founded was that bruton came over from brutus came over from troy with Corinius after being defeated there eventually made his way to britain and founded the british Isles after battling with giants founded londinium having Gog Magog as its porters and protectors and things like this. Um, and that, and then these, all these other stories were, would have been ingrained into the story of Bran and his head and all these different things. And it kind of got Christianized and pushed out and changed to like bring in this really dull version of history just to do with like, um, the romans and then before that there was a few stone circles before that was the dinosaurs and that's pretty much all you get and so yeah so there's, there's different elements of like the way things are covered up here not just the disappearance of the bones mm. yeah now it's interesting like we seem to push dinosaur movies as you mentioned dinosaurs are big things quite popular with these films like jurassic park and whatnot but as soon as you want to talk about the history of people it's like there's a lot of closed doors and hushed tones about going on. And, uh, you know, I mean, the fact that <laughs> English heritage are making so much money out of people <laughs> visiting Stonehenge, and yet they're not paying homage to these giants that allegedly built it, you know. Giants have rights too, you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we should but, start a campaign. <laughs> yeah, diversity and all that kind of stuff, you know. Um, well, in the, in the late 1800s, there was kind of a war of science and religion, and science won, and partially, rightfully so, because there was a lot of um, uh, misinformation or disinformation, or you know, there a lot of wrong information, I should say, uh, 
you know, the earth is 4,004 years old, things like that, um, where uh, science wrested away control of the narrative, if you will. So these ideas of giants, they're considered um, mythological, religious ideas of a flood. I'll, I'll just quickly say James Lawrence Powell, one of the um, prime scientists behind the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, just came out with a scientific paper called Premature Rejection of Science uh, of, of Science in, oh, I'm sorry, Premature Rejection of Science. Yeah. So he talks about how, many, how much skepticism he faced with the idea of a cataclysm. You know, and now it's been verified. There's so much science behind it. This, this Younger Dryas event that happened about 12,000 years ago. And he talks about the main skeptics called his theory and his colleagues' theory pathological science. They equated it to UFOs and aliens all in the scientific paper. And basically, their critique was based on no valid science. It was like hysteria. And, and these guys are trying to rewrite history and they're being mythological and all these ideas. So that is the downside or the dark side of science. There isn't an, an appreciation for the oral traditions or the religious documents. And because of human nature, that can turn that into a filtering mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, is everybody on the same page? Like, let's cover this shit up. No, they found hobbits in Indonesia in 2003. They found Denisovitz in 2010 with giant teeth. They just found in 2018 the Dragon Man skull from China, a Denisovitz skull, we believe. That's absolutely enormous. And it, we'll see what the thigh bones yield. Hopefully they find more evidence. Um, so I don't believe in these ideas of massive cover-ups. But, you know, you get it like the Smithsonian never accounted for what their scientists found, what their scientists recorded. They had a racist and zealous head of the anthropology department for like uh, 50 years, Dr. Herlichka. And he, in fact, believed nobody entered the United States before 2000 BC for the longest time. They had a lot of theories that are absolutely wrong. And now we know people were in the United States at least 23,000 years ago. And there was a raging debate for decades and, and, and claims of, of contamination of evidence and incompetence in the scientific world. It's like a soap opera in, in the academic world sometimes, the way they go each, at each other and the way people are wedded to their theories. So the human ego probably has more to do with these ideas than, than um, dark corridors and secret warehouses, in my estimation. But I'm open to the idea of like, strange shit going on behind the scenes but you got to think validly don't drag in every academic and every scientist into the mix that because you lose you lose people like that because it can't be you can't have a overreaching uh conspiracy that involves like all these people but you I can have i think rather, know, rather than a conspiracy that involves all the people I, th I i tend to look at it like there is a scientific dogma or doctrine almost like a religion and if uh, it, people often think about their credentials, they think about the, um, their pensions and their positions and their titles, and sometimes they veer more towards the official line to try and kind of save their careers than what's actually true, in the same way that a bishop may have a slightly different idea from what the Pope says, but obviously doesn't want to get burnt at the stake in the medi medieval times uh, for going off, off peace, so I, to speak. I completely agree, and I'll just say, I find science is like kind of like an atheistic cult yeah. where they're yeah. too far on the other side. They don't embrace, you know, these ideas of near death experiences and reincarnation and the mystical realms and the ancient scientists like Pythagoras and Plato, they all went to mystery school initiations. They all blended science and spirituality mm. and the, 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 the ancient people that you and I are talking about, they clearly had this megalithic science that was a blend of both. And you can see what happens. You have the Middle Ages when religion, organized religion takes over and they're dumping piss on each other's heads in the, you know, in the streets of France. And then you have the the Elon Musk world of every every billionaire has their own spaceship and mega yacht <laughs> and owns a shitload of crypto. So, you know, the blend of science and spirituality is where it's at. That's my point. You do get do get exceptions because Neil, we've had, we've had a uh, a neurosurgeon or a very kind of mainstream medical doctor that actually yes. had a near death experience. Um, yes, do you uh, Doctor Ian Rubenstein, a, a regular GP or MD. No, there's another one, American story. guy, an American guy. Yes, oh. he wasn't on our show, but we've discussed him. That's um, I thought he was. Yes. Oh, okay, he was from. Yeah, Harvard. I know his, who you mean. I've forgotten his name. Yeah, yeah, his name was like Abel or something like that. And when he came out, he had mm. a 
page news Newsweek article. I'm like, oh great, they're gonna embrace this. He, he was didn't. dead for a long time. <laughs> And everybody shit, all his colleagues shit on him like he was, you know, it's like you remember the club until you aren't. And I was kind of bummed out. It's like, what's his third grade? The guy clearly had this experience. Yeah. Um, talked yeah. to him. Yeah, it's like Abel or a man or something like that. But anyway, you know, I don't want to get off on a tangent, but it, it's good to be open minded about these things and understand it's a blend of science and spirituality. And that's with you. We're not anti science, we're not anti evolution, mm. but we embrace and are open to the, the metaphysical realities as well. Mm. Yeah. I'm not anti-science, so, I'm anti-cult. <laughs> I'm anti-cult. So, uh, now you've done the British Isles, what's the next plan for the next book? <clears throat> well, well, I think we are going to eventually do the worldwide book, but it's going to be ridiculous. It's just, you know, just what we found in America and uh, in Britain, we've, you know, we've cut out thousands of accounts already. So it's going to be fun trying to put that into a, an average size book. But eventually we'll, we'll be working on that. We've got a few other projects we're working on. I'm working on a couple of things myself. Jim's uh, doing his Fish Gods book, um, which he's working away on, is with the Atlantean connection. Uh, but we're going to get our heads together probably in a year's time um, and probably kind of focus on that because we have collected accounts and we have got some remarkable stories and myths and legends that all fit in with what we've done already that no one's really heard about. I mean, this is like kind of like it's just not out there. You know, you, you mean, half, I mean, half of our book, we have to like dig into records and purchase these strange out of print academic books, that, you know, been out of print for 25 years um, just to get all the data together. Even some of the myths and stories would have been lost if it wasn't for one particular guy collecting them you know from his local kind of elders in wales back in the 1920s and 30s and things like this so you've got to like there's, there's little things like this people don't realize you mm. know we've had to go on microfilm in libraries to discover accounts and get photos that were previously lost because they're just not on the internet um and we really the internet is only like a small proportion of our research nowadays when, when you're looking into this kind of thing but i think you know i think we're going to have to do a world we have to do a trilogy of books i guess um and we're also going to do a little wooden book on giants probably called the little book of giants um <laughs> uh, eventually which will be a bit more fun a bit more tongue-in-cheek um but yeah i don't know what i, mean, I don't know what else you, you're working on the fish gods right jim <laughs> yes i'm working on a god uh, a book about the androgynous nature of the gods and i like to look around the world and like i said you, you find so many similar things that's what that's what piques people in people's interest because it's like so well beyond coincidence, uh, it, it, it just opens you up to really hypothesize about what it means. But I would say, yeah, like our previous two books, the book we're talking about today, I think, I think they're, they're, they're just really well done. It took us years. Once we finished, quote unquote, it took us another like year on each book. Um, we were diligent to the, get to the bottom of, of every story we could. And I think we just portray kind of um, a story that is rooted in science but rooted in mythology as well and, and i think people hopefully will appreciate that look at the reviews on amazon if anybody's interested in getting the books we get pretty good reviews and i think that you and i bring um, a sensibility to the ancient mysteries world we're not blowing smoke up people's ass we're not scammers we're not bullshit artists we like to uh in dive into these ideas because um there's a metaphysical story as well there's like almost a self-improvement story studying mm. ancient people and ancient myths and ancient ways of doing business. And I, I feel like, you know, for us, it's it's um, it's helpful to, to read the mind of the ancients and see what they have to say about the nature of reality and what all these stories mean, kind of like in a Joseph Campbell-esque way. So, mm. you know, I will say that uh, the archetypes are there, the information is there, um, you know be open to these possibilities and you know i'd recommend our books not to you know talk our game up but you know i think they're very well written and very interesting <laughs> I, I i think our audience are very open-minded this is why they 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 watch us and things um apart mm -hmm. from the old skeptic who just watches us for fun because they're bored on a saturday night and they have no <laughs> friends but uh oh, we love from, skeptics yeah we yeah, love yeah yeah we love them <laughs> Um, so uh, megalomania that is that the website that people can go to Hugh, for it, it, information it, 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 
it's megalithomania. Megalithomania. Just, yeah, just to okay. make sure people don't think we're megalomaniacs. Yeah, just want to clear <laughs> that one up. Megalithomania.com, uh, yeah, is it? No, it's dot co dot uk. But uh, if people just search for the giants of Stonehenge and, and, and ancient Britain, they'll find me and Jim. They can just, uh, yeah, but most of it's up on there. We've got uh, a sort of Facebook page dedicated to the book where we do updates and things like that. And also our YouTube channel, Megalithomania UK, has tons of stuff with me and jim uh talking about this we have free lectures uh, and everything else and um and yeah i mean um it's yeah it's worth looking into this i mean i think it's it's personally i see it as like a missing chapter in british history because it's mm. not being covered the only person who covered it we must mention is oh. anthony roberts whose book sowers of thunder that came out in 1978 was a revelation he was contemporary with john john michelle paul Devereux wrote the foreword to that book and it was about the giant myths and he he was the first to really notice the geomantic connection with these giant stories how geomancy ley lines earth mysteries which was becoming big in the 70s it was actually recorded in these myths and legends and stories but no one had noticed them before and so we've kind of taken that and taken that as our springboard and found hundreds of other kind of stories and accounts that kind of fit in with that theory one other one other thing that note the name of the book is called his book was called sowers of thunder now we that's one of the other paranormal supernatural elements is that when you disturb a giant's grave even in modern times great thunderstorms and lightning and bad luck will occur and we do a whole chapter devoted to that we've got you know and this has happened over and over again we're talking about a whole different level to the whole king tut kind of tutankhamun kind of a, a thing we're talking like people literally start digging a grave within seconds a giant thunderstorm and lightning is happening almost as though there's a connection like these sites were kind of had a spell over them or some kind of ancient science we don't yet understand mm. so there's this kind of thing as well that we get into in the book and we, we did dedicate it to anthony roberts and i just wanted to throw him in there because he was one of the biggest kind of inspirations and in, uh, in the kind of you know kind of quiet guidance that we followed when putting this all together excellent all right. Well, thank you very much. We're running out of time now, but uh, it's been really, really interesting. So thanks to Hugh and Jim, authors of The Giants of Stonehenge and Ancient Britain, available from Amazon and all good bookshops and online shops as well. Uh, good luck with the future work and research you're doing. More digging up. and Well, take take rubber sho shovels is all I can suggest. Uh, <laughs> if there's storms are brewing when you go digging. <laughs> uh, but yeah, good luck for that. And also your tours as well. And uh, for the future research on uh, giants and gods and all the other stuff, it's uh, <laughs> all very interesting stuff. But anyway, we're out of time. So thanks very much indeed to our guests. Thanks very much indeed for you for listening and watching. And stay tuned for next time on the Paranormal Peep Show. Good night. Take care. Thank you.